song. Now we'll look at the message through God's holy word. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in John chapter 4, the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. The message this morning is simply entitled, Jesus is the Living Water. When I gave you the introduction to the Gospel of John several weeks ago as we're walking verse by verse of the book of John, I told you that there's seven I am statements, seven times where Jesus claims to be God. When you go back to Exodus where God tells Moses to tell them I am sent you, you see that statement repeated seven times and then we added several more that have predicates to it. This morning we're going to look at one of those and what does it mean that God is your living water, that Jesus gives you something that will cause you to never thirst again spiritually. The purpose of the Gospel of John is in John chapter 20. You're in John chapter 4. If you have a handout, sermon notes this morning, you can take those out and a copy of God's Word. There was no way I could put all 45 verses of Scripture on your handout this morning. I hope that didn't turn some of you off this morning that we're going to cover 45 verses. You're already looking at your watch. John 4 will be there momentarily. Here's the purpose of the Gospel of John in John 20, verse 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, Gospel of John. But these are written, these seven to eight miracles that are written in the Gospel of John are written so that you may believe something very important. Not just believe, but believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah, the Son of God, and here's the second full purpose of the Gospel of John, that by believing, you may have life in his name. Real spiritual life. Not just existing, not just going through the motions, but real life, not eternal life, only one day, but God in your life now, leading you every single day, and to see it in its fulfillment one day when Christ parts the sky to come to call us home. Are you really living this morning? Do you have real life in Jesus Christ? Is he really your living water. In the Gospel of John, you see many encounters that Jesus has. Sovereign God gives us these encounters. The first one we saw was with a man named Nicodemus, a religious leader in John chapter 3. We see a man in John chapter 3. We see a morally right person, but not spiritually right in Nicodemus. He was a religious leader, but did not have a relationship with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 4, we're going to see the exact opposite interaction. We're going to see Jesus interact with a woman, not just a woman, but a Samaritan woman, and not just a Samaritan woman, but a woman that was living a very immoral lifestyle. We see one extreme to the other, both lost, both needing an encounter with Jesus Christ. God saves all people who desire to be saved no matter how religious or moral they think they are or how immoral they know they really are, we're all separated in our sin and apart from God if it wasn't for his grace to save us. And so we're going to see this example in John chapter 4. I need to give you a brief history lesson of the Samaritans so you understand where Jesus and this encounter with this woman at the well in John chapter 4 comes from. You can trace this all the way back to the kingdom of Israel during the reign of David. When David was king, his son Solomon set up the temple in Jerusalem, but it was destroyed later. It was rebuilt in the days of Jesus by King Herod. But after Solomon was on the scene, the nations were split. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom's capital was Jerusalem. Southern kingdom's capital was Judah. And so you have these two different nations that are divided. Well, what happened when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom in 722 BC, many of the Jews were exiled. They were deported and they set up their capital now in Samaria. You can understand that the Samaritans now are a mixed breed of the Jews that remained there that weren't exiled and the pagans that were brought into that area after the Assyrians conquered. As you can guess, there was many different false religions being taught at that time. So that the Samaritans 
believed in the first five books of the Bible, but they did not believe in the Psalms. They did not believe in the prophets in God's word. They picked and cho chose what type they wanted to believe. They didn't want to have anything to do with Jerusalem since they had set their capital up elsewhere. So anytime the mention of Jerusalem came up, they ignored that. So the Jews hated the Samaritans because they didn't think all of God's word was inspired. The prophets were inspired. They went up against the Samaritans and they despised and hated the Samaritans so much that they would refuse to go through Samaria on the way to Jerusalem. They would walk around through the Transjordan Highway and make a longer trip because they so despise the Samaritans. But you're gonna see the first point that I put on your handout this morning is that Jesus had a divine appointment. So Jesus did not go around Samaria it says in the Greek, it was necessary that he went through Samaria because he knew he was going to have an encounter with the woman at the well. Jesus seeks after us. Aren't you glad that God seeks after us? He pursues us. John chapter 4, let's begin in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, and we see a little aside here in verse 2. Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. In verse 3, Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. It was necessary for him to go through Samaria, not around as all the Jews would do. Then it says in verse 5, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, he was a human being too, he's the God man, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. It was high noon, hottest part of the day. Verse 7, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had, have, have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank for it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him, notice this phrase, this is very important this morning, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What does that mean? We'll talk about it this morning. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I put Luke 19, 10 next on your handout this morning. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus sought this woman out. It was necessary for him to go through Samaria to have this encounter with the Samaritan woman. And you're going to see as a result of that, many people in Sychar became true believers in Jesus Christ as a result of God transforming this immoral woman by the righteous blood of Jesus Christ so that those around her saw the difference in her life and wanted the same for themselves. Interesting story. What is interesting to me also is Jacob's well is there. It's over 2,000 years old now when Jesus is there. God in his sovereignty had that well placed there. And if you read history right now, that well is still there, still providing physical water as a symbol of the spiritual water we need from Jesus Christ. Now over 4,000 years providing water. It's high noon. Jesus is wearied from his journey in verse 6. He sits beside the well, waiting for his divine appointment. As sovereign God would have it, his disciples went on into town to get food. Because he didn't want the disciples there telling him who he could talk to and who he couldn't talk to. Because Jews were not supposed to associate with Samaritans. 
Then it says, the woman came out, verse 7, to draw water. Notice she comes out alone. She has isolated herself because she's embarrassed. She doesn't want to have anything to do with anybody else. Everybody knew her immoral lifestyle. Jesus will talk to her about her moral lifestyle in just a moment. She comes out at the worst part of the day to draw water. All the other ladies came out early in the morning to draw water so they would have it to bathe with, to wash their cooking utensils with, to have water to drink with. But this lady came at the worst time knowing no one else would be there because she was ostracized by everyone in that area. She was looking for satisfaction with an immoral lifestyle and Jesus is gonna come satisfy her. The only way true satisfaction comes from and it's the living water of Jesus Christ. It's gonna show us a very important message this morning that Christ and Christ alone satisfies. God did not design your marriage to satisfy you and give you complete happiness. God did not design your job to satisfy you and give you complete satisfaction. God did not design your children that he blessed you with to bring you 100% satisfaction. Those are extra blessings in life that we get to enjoy because of Almighty God we serve. But the only one who truly satisfies is Jesus Christ. People try to find satisfaction in all the other places except the only true place we can find it, and that's Christ and Christ alone. That's gonna be the message over and over again this morning, so please don't miss the message. Much to her surprise at the well, Jesus is gonna say, give me a drink, you see in verse seven. Now what you have to understand is that Samaritans were so despised by the Jews that the Jews came up with their own regulations on what they could do to interact with the Samaritans. You're gonna see later that it said that they had no interactions with them. That's not the best translation into the English language because they did have interactions with them. The disciples were in town buying food from them, having an interaction with them to purchase food. But what they were not allowed to do was to share any food or any utensils used for food, which would include not sharing something to drink water out of. They were not allowed by their customs to interact with Samaritans and share that because Samaritans were deemed unclean by the Jews. So when Jesus says, give me a drink, she's taken back. So her response is a natural response when a Jew has asked her for water. It says in verse 10, when she says, why do you want to ask me for water? In verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She doesn't get it. She doesn't understand what living water, she automatically thinks of physical water. You mean I might can get some physical water that never runs out? that never causes me to be thirsty again so I can stop coming to this well at high noon? I'm embarrassed enough to come even then, so can you give me something to satisfy me physically? She's missing the point that a relationship with Jesus Christ is not about the physical, it's about the spiritual. So the woman is very puzzled. In verse 11, she says, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. They would have a container that was probably covered with sheepskin, they would normally carry that with them to get water with. Jesus doesn't have one with them. The disciples probably had it when they went into town to get food. Jesus probably on purpose didn't have it. And she's saying, you have nothing to get water with. You can't share with me because Jews don't have interactions with Samaritans. And the well is deep. Verse 11, where do you get that living water? How are you gonna get the living water, Jesus? In verse 12, she makes a statement. Are you greater than our father Jacob? What's the answer to that question? <laughs> He's the king of kings, Lord of lords, the almighty one. He's the one who created all things. We learned in John chapter one. So of course he is greater than our father Jacob. He's the reason the well there to begin with. He says, he gave us the well and drank from himself as did his sons and livestock. She's basically saying, who are you Jesus? You're nowhere near important as Jacob is to us. Verse 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. There could be somebody here this morning that's trying to find happiness in all the ways of the world and they keep getting thirsty 
and thirsty and thirsty because they've never drank from the living water of Jesus Christ. They try it in relationships, they try it in hobbies, they try it in jobs. This lady had tried it with five different husbands and she could not find happiness, so she went from one husband to another husband to another husband. She was just trying to find satisfaction in life, but she was looking in the wrong place. That's how most of the world is. They just choose different avenues of finding that satisfaction. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. So Jesus says, if you'll drink spiritually of me, you will never thirst again. But look at verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Don't miss this next phrase. This is very important this morning. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. It's a very neat phrase in the Greek language, which means when God saves you and gives you the Holy Spirit, he puts inside of you a great passion and desire to follow Jesus Christ. It wells up inside of you. It's almost like you can't control it. Why? Because you don't control it anyway. The Holy Spirit does it in your life. That means if you're truly saved, there's a passion, there's a desire in you for Christ and Him alone to be glorified over every other area of your life. It doesn't mean you have to be emotional about it. God's given people different personalities. It doesn't mean you have to jump up and down at church to show your passion for Jesus Christ. Some people do, that's the way God's wired them. But it means deep within your soul, if God has saved you and given you the living water, it's so deep and welled up inside of your soul that that's the thing that drives you more than anything else in this world. There's a lot of people that don't have that living water. There's a lot of people in this world who will claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, but the passion in their life is not their savior. It's a job, it's a spouse, it's kids, it's a hobby, but it's not Jesus Christ. If God saved you, God indwells you by the power of the Holy Spirit and you can't contain yourself because every day you fall more in love with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Every day you think about what he did for you on the cross at Calvary and you get to the point where you just can't contain the love you have in the depths of your soul for Christ, for who he is and what he's done for you. It's not about religion. We saw that with Nicodemus. It's not about how far away you've been with God. We see that here with the woman at the well. Incredible, incredible picture. Listen to this commentary on this phrase, welled up in you to eternal life, sprung up in you. It says, the picture painted here of water is so alive, so dynamic, so energetic and powerful that it's not only would assuage thirst for a moment, it would begin to pour up out of the soul of the person and continue to nurture them day after day, year after year. An incredible metaphor of living water, physical water to spiritual water, that when the Holy Spirit saves you, indwells you, you don't thirst for the things of this world anymore. Because you know the things of this world that you tried for satisfaction never brought it anyway, and you know that real satisfaction in life, real joy and peace and comfort in life doesn't come from the outside, it comes from what the Holy Spirit has done on the inside of your life. That means we seek after him. A lot of people in this world today are seeking after the gifts of God over the giver of the gifts, God himself. They're worshiping idols and they don't even know it. Now I've got to stop here. I've got to explain this. I've done this many times and I want you to understand this. We use phrases a lot when we describe our lost, unbelieving friends. They're just seeking after, they're seeking for Jesus. They're searching for God. Number one, that's an unbiblical statement. Romans 3, 10 says, As it's written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. Listen to this phrase. Romans 3, verse 11. No one seeks God. Now we use that phrase. It's interesting that we use that phrase. I'm not a Tom, Thomas Aquinas fan. There's some things that he believes that I don't believe spiritually. But there's... When there's truth, it's truth, no matter who it comes from. So Thomas Aquinas was asked about this 
comment, how can we say people seek after God when the Bible in Romans 3.11 says no one seeks God? Why do we use that phrase? Here's what Aquinas says. He said, such people are not actually seeking God. Instead, they are desperately seeking peace, seeking relief from their guilt, seeking something to fill the emptiness of their souls and their lives. Then he goes on to say, people desperately search for the things that only God can give them while at the same time they are fleeing from him. That's pretty deep this morning. I want you to put yourself in the position of the woman at the well. She can't find satisfaction in life. No one in the city likes her. No one wants to be her friend. She comes at high noon to get water and no one wants to talk to her. She sneaks out there hoping to have an encounter with no one. All along. Five husbands she's had. If I can just find one, the, husband, the right husband, I'll find satisfaction in life. And you're going to find out the one she's with now is not her husband, Jesus says. That's just what she chose to find satisfaction in life. Different people search in different ways. And we can point our fingers and judge people, but you can't blame the woman. She's looking for satisfaction, but she's just looking in the wrong place. She's miserable. But if she, somebody asks her how she's doing, she'll give the church answer, I'm good. How are you doing? But all, all the time searching, all the time looking, not seeking after God, seeking for happiness, and God comes looking for her. God comes on purpose through Sychar to have a divine encounter with this woman that teaches us about the mighty grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's going to offer her something she's been looking for but didn't know what she was looking for. Living water. And she misses it. Catch verse 15 here. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. We know she's thinking of physical water because she says, or have to come here to draw water. She's missing the point. She's thinking of physical water. I don't have to come here anymore and be embarrassed. I can stay at home and have an endless supply of physical water. Now, pick up in verse 16. Jesus is going to confront her and show her who she really is so she'll see who he really is and then she's going to change the subject because she's going to get uncomfortable. It's amazing how we change the, 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 the subject when God makes us uncomfortable. Brother Ricky, please don't preach on that. It makes me uncomfortable. Verse 16, John chapter 4, as we walk through this. John chapter 4, verse 16. He says, go call your husband and come here. To this, the woman replied, verse 16, I have no husband, into verse 17. Verse 17, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. <laughs> She's going to change the subject right after in verse 19. She says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> you must be sent from God. She didn't realize he was God. But obviously God gave you some ability to see the past. So now she's going to change the subject. So what better way to change the subject than ask a theological question that's been debated for many years between them, the Samaritans and the Jews, on where they should worship. Jesus in his sovereignty is going to take her aside and teach us an importance about worship while he's teaching us the importance of drinking from him, the living water, to give spiritual life. So she's going to say, where should we worship at? You Jews say Jerusalem is where we should worship in verse 20. But we Samaritans think we should worship on Mount Gerizim. She's asking a place of worship, and she's using it to get off the subject of herself and the fact that she's miserable in her life, and she realizes he's a prophet. So let's stop talking about me. Let's talk about some theological question. So Jesus is going to teach her a lesson and then get back to the truth here that he's trying to show her. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, verse 21, when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now there's some commentators that say God is saying it's not important that you go worship. I disagree. He's saying there's coming a point 
Jerusalem will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. There will be no more worship. AD 70, when the temple was destroyed, there will be no more worship in Jerusalem or on Mount Gerizim. Worship's important. He's going to tell her, this is how you should worship. Then in verse 22, he's going to call her an agnostic. An agnostic means without knowledge. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know. You're an agnostic. You have no knowledge of who you worship or why you worship, Jesus says. Jesus says, we Jews worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. We know God because he's revealed himself to the Jews through his holy word. But you Samaritans don't believe anything but the first five books of the Bible. You don't believe what the prophets say. You don't believe what the psalmists say. You don't see the revealed word of God. You have no knowledge. Agnostic. Interesting. Which tells me there's people today that can worship without knowledge. They worshiped on Mount Gerizim but they weren't worshiping the one true God. So an aside on this message, a very important aside, if you have something to write with, just write down principles of worship because it matters how we worship. Why? Because Jesus tells us how to worship. He tells us this is the kind of worshipers the Father on Father's Day seeks. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers, every time there's the authentic, there's the counterfeit. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. There's two things God's looking for in worship, spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. See who's doing the seeking there? The Father. God is spirit and those who worship him must they must worship him the way God requires them to, in spirit and in truth. She's trying to divert attention off of herself. Jesus is going to teach a very important message to us all on worship while he's telling her that she needs to have the living water welled up inside of her. He's going to give her the living water in just a moment, but he's going to teach her the importance of worshiping the way God requires us to worship. Now, I hope you understand when I'm fixed. I'm not going to say fixing to, that's my Mississippi again. I'm going to share with you this morning. Many people today do not understand the Old Testament because many people today don't study the Word of God very deeply. Let's just be real honest this morning. And since many people don't study the Old Testament, they don't meditate on the Word of God, they don't understand the character of God that's revealed about Him in the Old Testament. So when people come to church, they make the focus of their worship who? Jesus. And that's not all wrong <laughs> because I believe in the Trinity, that God exists in the triune form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when God says this is what he wants us to focus on in worship, who should we focus on more than anyone of the Trinity? The Father. Because it's God the Father who is seeking worshipers to worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus could have said, you should worship me. I'm not saying we don't. Jesus came to point people back to the Father. So we should worship Jesus and give him glory with our hearts still focused on the one who sent him here to begin with, that part of the Trinity, which is God the Father. Interesting when we talk about that on Father's Day this morning. Listen to Mary's big Magnificat in Luke 1, 46. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Because Jesus was sent here to reconcile us to who? The Father. That was his mission. That was his purpose. And Jesus says, you should worship me in spirit, the Father, and in truth. And Mary's shouting out, my soul magnifies the Lord. The deepest part of my being magnifies the Lord. To worship God in spirit means, first of all, you have to have a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. Lost people can't worship God. But it's more than that. 
It just doesn't mean you have the Holy Spirit in you. It's more than that. To worship God in spirit means from the depth of your being, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and you're welled up into eternal life, Scripture says in John 4, and you are so passionate about your Savior that you want to exalt Him and Him alone. And you won't worship false things. You can't show up to church and just go through the motions. You can't just play the religious game. You know, the Bible tells us what true worship is. It also tells us what false worship is. If you look in Jeremiah, and you write down Jeremiah chapter 7, they're worshiping God in the temple, and God's going to say, you need to go to Shiloh and worship. And when you get there, you need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and quit going through the motions of dead, lifeless worship. Could you have come in this place this morning and worshiped, but not worshiped God? And gone through dead, lifeless worship? That's not the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. The Father seeks people who will worship Him with everything in their being, not just on Sunday morning, but the way they live their life every single day, because Romans 12 tells us that we are a living sacrifice, that we are a living form of worship every single day. There's a lot of people still playing the legalism of religion, going to church to make themselves feel better, but they're not true worshipers of Jesus Christ. They don't have the living water indwelling their soul and that's not their focus in their life. Then we're told this, that we should worship in spirit and in truth. There's a true way to worship Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, John 14, 6. He's the only way to the Father. But we should worship him in the truth of his revealed word on who he is and how he's asked us to worship him. There's a true way to worship. I don't think there's ever been a time in Christian history like it is today where the church has been exposed to, lack of better terms, experimental worship. What do I mean by experimental worship? There's churches today that give out surveys. Let's do an experiment. And you put down the types of songs you want to sing and your friends want to sing. We call that seeker sensitive because we want people to come and have their needs met. Don't turn me off yet. Listen to the whole thing here. So it's experimental. Let's find out what they want. Let's, whatever the survey says the most people want, that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll please the most people we can. Who do we need to please in worship? God. God alone. That means our worship must be biblical. Our worship must be accurate. I'm so thankful for Jim Baham and the fact that we don't sing songs unless they're theologically true according to the scriptures. There's mean there's some popular songs out there we don't sing because they go against the word of God. Because it matters what we sing to God. It matters how we sing it to God. We should worship in spirit and in truth. There's people who want sermons that way to meet their needs. We need felt need sermons. Because people don't want to come and think the Bible's irrelevant, church is irrelevant. So we need to entertain them. We need to meet their felt needs because they might not come to church here if we don't. I love you, but that's not biblical worship. In fact, if you want to see the only felt needs worship service in Scripture, you got to go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 32, where they worship a golden calf at Mount Sinai to meet the felt needs of the people. Oh, they were worshiping, but that's called idolatry. It's not what you signed up for this morning, I know. But people actually worship worship. People actually worship churches, worship leaders, pastors, instead of worshiping God the Father in spirit and in truth. And he's telling this lady, this woman at the well, oh, you worship at Mount Gerizim because you're a Samaritan, but you worship without knowledge. You're an agnostic. Let me tell you who you should worship and how you should worship, and I'm going to save you and give you living water, and you'll never worship the same again. It matters how you worship. It matters who 
you worship. Then she, God's going to reveal to him his identity. Jesus is as the God man. In verse 25, she's going to say, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all these things. Thank you, prophet, for sharing it. But when Jesus comes, we'll really understand it. In verse 26, you got to love how humble and simple Jesus is. He says, I who speak to you am he. In other words, Jesus says, I'm the one. I am, a great I am statement. Jesus says, I'm God. I'm the one he sent. Part of God. I'm the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I wonder what she thought then. I thought he was just a prophet. <laughs> then she's going to run to town. Listen to verse 27. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. <laughs> no disrespect to women, but in biblical times, men didn't talk to women. Especially not in public. Especially not a Jew to a Samaritan woman. But no one said, what do you seek? In other words, Jesus, what are you looking for? Why are you talking to her? Verse 28, so the woman left her water. I think that's hilarious. She came for physical water and she didn't take it back with her because she had something far better than physical water. She had the living water of Jesus Christ. She forgot about her physical needs because she had her spiritual need met. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, remember the ones she had no relationships with, didn't want to see, she's coming at high noon, she don't want to interact with nobody, now she's running to them to tell them about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Notice they don't know she's been changed. All they see her is an immoral woman. She no longer cares. She's been given living water. God saved her soul. She's realized who she was, by God's prophecy, and now she's realized who Jesus is, the Messiah. So the woman left her water jar, went away into town, and said to the people, verse 29, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Notice she didn't want to preach to them because they saw her as an immoral woman still. She didn't want to say he is the Christ. She phrased it as a question, come and see because I think he's the Christ. So they would come and check it out on their own. And it says, verse 30, they went out of the town and were coming to him, Jesus. Now, verse 31, we see another important truth as we close. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. They went into town to get food. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Sometimes the Bible, to me, is just comical. So the disciples said to one another, hey, did you bring him some food to eat? I didn't give him any food to eat. Did you give him a snicker bar? Because I didn't give him anything. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus says, What consumes me, what drives me, what fills me, what motivates me is to do the will of the Father. Another important lesson that if Jesus is the living water, what motivates us, what feeds us, what consumes us, what drives us is to God's glory, for him to be glorified, for him to be lifted up on high and given all the credit and glory that's due his name. That means we don't take any for ourselves. Then he says in verse 35, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Verse 36, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have not entered into their labor. That's the food Jesus is talking about that drives them. The Great Commission, sharing the gospel, going out and planting seeds so that God brings in the harvest. We're just the laborers. We're just the bearers of good news. How much does sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ well up inside of you that you can't wait to share the gospel with one more lost person? Verse 39. 
he's going to show some harvest right here. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. We have heard for ourselves, and we know they now have knowledge. They were agnostic. They were without knowledge. Now they know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Remember the first purpose of the book of John? So people will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Second one, about believing that we have eternal life, real spiritual life now as well. Verse 43. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Going to fulfill prophecy there. Verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Jesus goes to a woman at the well who is looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. And he gives her the only thing that can satisfy himself, the living water. And then he gives her an example and his disciples that what should drive us should be the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. What should motivate us should be the fact that we have drank from the well that never runs dry and we've drank of the well of the Holy Spirit, we're never the same again. And we desire to worship Him by the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of His revealed Word and the truth of how He asks us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We can't go through the motions. We can't play games religiously. We want our Father to seek after us and be considered true worshipers the Father desires to have. I'm telling you, we're living in a dangerous world today with the way religion is. There's a lot of churches today that care more about pleasing people than pleasing God. I can change the way I preach. We can change the way we do worship here and we'll grow by the thousands but it'll not be honoring God. I can send survey after survey after survey and see what's the most popular style of worship, what do y'all want to do during the service, and we can do exactly what the popular vote is, and we can see more and more people come in, but I don't think we'll be growing disciples of Jesus Christ. We'll be growing people's felt needs being met. But the most important need we have is not a felt need. The most important need we have is to be consumed by an almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to save us, to keep us saved, to indwell us, so that we desire to live for him more tomorrow than we have today. And next week, we desire to live for him more than we did this past week. And every single day, we fall more and more in love with our Savior because it's welled up in us. And we know we've got eternal life, but we're just consumed by him so much now that we can't even contain ourselves. I can't tell you how many people in this church have emailed me, texted me, come up to me after the service saying, I almost exploded during worship. I just couldn't contain myself. I said, go ahead. Explode. It's okay with me. That's all right. Please stop worrying about what other people may think. Just worship God. Just give Him the glory that's due His name. Just desire for the person sitting next to you that you don't know if it's lost or saved to have the living water consume them. Because just like Jesus sought out the woman at the well, He still seeks out people to save today. Because there's people seeking after things and they might say they're seeking after God, they're just seeking satisfaction. They don't realize yet because they're without knowledge. They're agnostic that it can only be found in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you came in here this morning without knowledge of who the real God is. And through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of him preaching his word, I'm just his vessel, I'm just his servant. He preached his word this morning. I really believe that. And he opened up your eyes to see your need for him. Then I'm asking you respond by repentance, respond by faith, 
place your trust in him as Lord and Savior, even while I'm speaking right now. If you are saved this morning, you have that living water, then I pray that he consumes you every day where you want to every day bring glory to the Father and him alone, that you seek after him now because now he has sought after you and saved you, and now you have the power of the Holy Spirit that draws you to him every single day of your life. This woman was changed forever. When she started her day, she was waiting to go to the well at noon when everybody else was gone. She had no idea what God was going to do in her soul, in her life. And God transformed her and saved her, and she didn't care about what people thought instantaneously. She went to those people that she was ostracized from, and she shared the truth about who Jesus Christ is. May we do the same today. Let's pray.